Chapter 7 35 Portland Row, the building that would function as both home and headquarters for the operatives of Lockwood & Company, was an unexpected sort of place. Appearing squat and squarish from the street, it was actually positioned at the top of a slight slope, so its rear elevation jutted out high over a jumble of brickled walled gardens. It had four doors, fl four floors, which ranged from tiny, the attic, to sprawling, the basement. Technically, the upper three levels were our living space, while the basement contained the office of the company. In fact, such divisions seemed rather blurred. The living areas, for instance, had all sorts of hidden doors that opened into weapon racks or swung out to become dartboards or spare beds or giant maps of London festooned with colored pins. Meanwhile, the basement itself doubled as a laundry room, which meant you'd be practicing Wessex half turns in the rapier room with a row of socks hanging from a clothesline beside your head or filling canisters from the salt box with the washing machine rumbling loudly in your ear. I liked it all immediately, though it puzzled me as well. It was a large house filled with expensive grown-up things, and yet there were no adults present anywhere, just Anthony Lockwood and his associate George, and now me. On the first afternoon, Lockwood took me on a tour. He showed me the attic first, low slung beneath steep eaves. It contained two rooms, a minuscule washroom in which sink, shower, and toilet practically overlapped, and a pretty attic bath bedroom, just big enough for a single bed or more and dresser. Opposite the bed, an arched gable window looked out over Portland Row as far as the ghost lamp on the corner. This is where I slept when I was little, Lockwood said. It hasn't been occupied for years. The last assistant, God rest him, chose to live out. You can use it if you like. Thanks, I said. I'd be pleased to. I know the bathroom's small, but at least it's your own. There's a bigger one downstairs, but that'll mean Sharon towels with George. Oh, I think I'll be fine here. We left the attic, trooped down the narrow stairs. The landing was dark and somber, with a circular golden rug in the center of the floor. Bookshelves on the corner were crammed with a random mixed of paperbacks, battered copies of the Fitz yearbook and Mottram's physical theories, an assortment of cheap novels, mostly pulp thrillers, and detective fiction, and serious works on religion and philosophy. As in the hall and living room below, various ethnic artifacts decorated the walls, including some kind of rattle seemingly made from human bones. Lockwood caught me staring at it. That's a Polynesian ghost chaser, he said. 19th century. Supposed, supposed to drive away spirits with a ruckus sound. Does it work? No idea. I've not tried it yet. Might be worth a go. He pointed to a door alongside. That's the bathroom, if you need it. This one's my room, and that's George's. I'd tread with caution there. I once walked in on him doing yoga in the nude. With difficulty, I drove the image from my mind. So, this was your house as a kid? Well, it belonged to my parents then. It's mine now, and yours, of course, for as long as you work here. Thanks. Tell me, did your parents... I'll show you the kitchen now, Lockwood said. I think George is making dinner. He started down the stairs. What's through there? I asked suddenly. There was one door he hadn't mentioned no different from the others, set close, close behind his own, beside his own. He smiled. That's private, if you don't mind. Don't worry, it's not very interesting. Come on, there's lots to see down here. The ground floor, comprised of a sitting room, library, and kitchen, was clearly the heart of the house, and the kitchen was where we would spend most of the time. It would be the place where we'd assemble for a pre-expedition supper, also where we'd gather for a late breakfast in the morning after. Its appearance reflected this fusion of work and lecture. The surfaces had all the usual domestic clutter, cookie tins, fruit bowls, bags of chips, but also sacks of salt and iron, carefully weighed and ready to go. There were 
rapiers propped behind the garbage bins and plasm-stained work boots soaking in a bucket. Oddest of all was the kitchen table and its great white tablecloth. The cloth was half covered with a spreading net of scribbled notes and diagrams and also drawings of several visitor subtypes, wraths, solitaires, and shades. We call this our thinking cloth, Lockwood said. It's not widely known, but I locate the bones of the French Church Street ghoul by sketching out the street plan here, over tea and cheese on toast at four o'clock in the morning. The cloth lets us jot down memos, the ories following interesting trains of thought. It's a very useful tool. It's also good for exchanging rude messages when a case hasn't gone well and we're not talking to each other, George said. He stood by the cooktop, tending to the evening stew. Eh, that doesn't happen often. Er, does that happen often? I asked. No, 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 Lockwood said. Almost never. George stirred the stew impl implacably. You wait and see. Lockwood clapped his hands together. Good. Have I shown you your office yet? You'll never guess the entrance where the entrance is. Look, it's over here. It turned out the basement offices of Lockwood and Company were reached directly from the kitchen. It wasn't exactly a secret door. The handle was in plain view, but from the outside it looked like nothing more than an ordinary closet. It had precisely the same wooden veneer and handle shape as all the other kitchen cabinets. When you opened it, however, a little light came on, revealing a set of spiral stairs curling steeply down. At the bottom of the stairs lay a string of open, exposed brick rooms, separated by arches and pillars and stretches of plastered wall. They were lit by a large window looking into the overgrown yard at the front of the house, and by angled skylights set into the ground alongside, along the side. The largest area contained three desks, a filing cabinet, two ready green armchairs, and a rather wonky bookshelf that Lockwood had assembled to hold his paperwork. A big black ledger sat resplendent on the central desk. Our case book, Lockwood said. It's got a history of everything we investigate. George compiles it and cross-references everything with files up here. Up there. He gave it a little sigh. He likes that sort of thing. Personally, I take each assignment as it comes. I glanced at the box files on the shelf. Each one had been neatly labeled by type and subtype. Type 1, Shades. Type 1, Lurkers. Type 2, Poltergeists. Type 2, Phantasms. And all the rest. At the end of the row was a thin file marked Type 3s. I stared at this. Have you actually encountered a Type 3? I asked. Lockwood shrugged. Hardly. I'm not even sure they exist. Through an arch off the main office was a side room, completely empty except for a rack of rapiers, a bowl of chalk dust, and two straw-filled filled visitor dummies hanging from a ceiling beam by iron chains. One of the dummies wore a bonnet and the other a top hat. Both were full of holes. Meet Joe and Esmeralda, Lockwood said. They are named after Lady Esmeralda and Floating Joe, two of the famous ghosts from Marissa Fitz's memoirs. Obviously, this is the rapier room. We practice here every afternoon. Of course, you'll be proficient with the sword already if you've passed your fourth grade. He glanced at me. I nodded. Of course, yes, absolutely. But it doesn't hurt to keep in shape, does it? I look forward to seeing you in action. And over here... Lockwood led me to a padlocked metal door set in the wall. Is our high security storeroom. Take a look inside. This storage area was the only separate portion of the basement, a small windowless room filled with shelves and boxes. It was here that all the most essential equipment was kept. The range of silver seals, the iron chains, the flares and canisters ordered directly from the Sunrise Corporation. Right now, it was also where the ghost jar, with its clamped brown skull and ectoplasmic host, was stored, concealed beneath its polka dot cloth. George gets it out to do experiments sometimes, Lockwood said. He wants to observe how ghosts respond to different stimuli. Personally, I'd rather he destroyed the thing, but he's gotten attached to it somehow. I eyed the cloth doubtfully. 
Just as during the interview, I thought I could almost hear a psychic noise, a delicate hum on the fringes of perception. So where did he get it from? I asked. Oh, he stole it. I expect he'll tell you about it sometime, but actually, it's not the only trophy we've got down here. Come over here and see. In the back of the wall basement, a modern glass door fortified with iron ghost bars led out into the garden. Alongside it, four shelves had been riveted into the brickwork. They housed a collection of silver glass cases with objects inside each one. Some of these were old, others very modern. I noticed among them a set of playing cards, a lock of long blonde hair, a lady's blood-stained glove, three human teeth, a gentleman's folded necktie, the most splendid case of all contained a mummified hand, as black and shriveled as a rotten ban banana, sitting on a red silk cushion. That's a pirate's, Lockwood said. Seventeen hundreds, probably. Belonged to a fellow who strung up and sun-dried on execution dock, where the mouse in the musket inn stands now. His spirit was a lurker. He'd given the barmaids a lot of trouble by the time I had dug that up. Well, this is all stuff George and I have collected over our career so far. Some are actual sources and very dangerous. They've got to be kept locked up, particularly at night. Others just need to be treated with caution. If you're sensitive, like the three I gave you in the interview. I'd seen them on the bottom shelf, the knife, the ribbon, and the unspeakable watch. Yeah, I said. You never told me what they were, Lockwood nodded. I'm sorry that the impressions you got were so grueling, but I didn't expect you to experience them so strongly. Well, the knife belonged to my uncle, who lived out in the country. He took it with him on walks and hunting expeditions. He had it with him when he dropped dead from a heart attack during a shoot. He was a kind man, and from what you said, the knife still had something something of his personality. I thought back to the peaceful sensations I'd picked up from the knife. It did. The ribbon came from a grave they opened in Kensal Green Cemetery when they were building one of the iron barriers around the perimeter last year. Coffin had a woman in it and a little child. The ribbon was in the woman's hair. The memory of my feelings as I held the slip of silk returned, my eyes filled with tears. I cleared my throat and made a big business of studying the nearest boxes. It wouldn't do to show weakness to Lockwood. Frailty was what visitors fed on. Frailty and loose emotions. Good agents needed the opposite, firm control and strength of nerve. My old leader, Jacobs, had lost his nerve, and what had happened? I had nearly died. I spoke in a cool, matter-of-fact voice. And the watch? Lockwood had been observing me closely. Yeah, the watch, you were right to sense its sinister residue. It's actually a memento of my first successful case, he paused significantly. No doubt you've heard of the murderer, Harry Crisp? My eyes grew round. Not the coin-in-the-slot killer? Er, uh, no, that was Clive Dilson. Oh, you mean the one who kept heads in the fridge? No, uh, that was Colin Buchanan Prescott. I scratched my chin. In that case, I've never heard of him. Oh, Lockwood seemingly slight, slightly deflated. I'm a little surprised. Do they have papers in the north of England? Well, it was thanks to me that Harry Crisp got put away. I was doing a sweep of the neighborhood in tooting out ha hunting type twos, you see, and I noticed all the death clothes in his garden. They'd been missed because he'd cunningly scattered iron f filings everywhere after the killings to suppress the ghosts, and it turned out later that while wearing that watch, it had been his beastly habit to lure dinner. George was standing at the top of the spiral stairs and ladle in his hand. 
I'll tell you about it another time, Lockwood said. We'd better go. George gets grouchy if we let the food get cold. If I knew straight away that I'd liked the oddities of my new home, I'd soon formed opinions about my fellow agents too. And right from the outset, these opinions diverged markedly. Lockwood, I had already liked. He seemed a world away from the remote and treacherous Agent Jacobs. His zest and personal commitment were clear. Here was someone I felt I could follow, someone perhaps to trust. But George Cubbins, no, he bothered me. I made heroic efforts not to get annoyed with him that first day, but it wasn't humanly possible. Take his appearance. There was something about it that acted as a trigger to one's worst instincts. His face was uniquely slappable. A nun would have ached to punch him, while his backside cried out to heaven for a well-placed kick. He slouched, he slumped, he scuffed his way about the house like something soft about to melt. His shirt was always untucked, his sneakers extra big, the laces trailing. I've seen reanimated corpses with better deportment than George. And that flop of hair, and those silly glasses, everything about him irritated me. He also had a particular trick of staring at me in a blank, expressionless sort of way that was somehow also rudely contemplative. It was like he was analyzing all of my faults and was simply wondering which one I was going to display next. For my part, I did my best to be polite during the first evening meal and restrained my basic instincts, which were to hit him over the head with a shovel. Later that night, coming down from my bedroom, I lingered for a moment at the first floor landing. I glanced through the bookshelves, inspected the Polynesian ghost chaser, and suddenly found myself standing outside the other bedroom door, the one Lockwood had said was private. It was a very ordinary looking door. There was a faint pale rectangle mark on the wood grain just below head head height where a sign or sticker had been removed. Otherwise, it was entirely blank. It didn't seem to have a lock. I would have been e- it would have been easy to peep inside, but clearly that would have have been wrong. I was just regarding the door speculatively when George Cubbins emerged from his room. A folded newspaper under his arm, he glanced across. I know what you're thinking, but that's the forbidden room. Oh, the door? I stepped away from it casually. Yes, why does he keep it shut? I don't know. Have you ever looked in? No. The spectacles regarded me. Of course not. He asked me not to. Oh, of course, of course. Quite right. So I smiled as amiably as I could. How long have you lived here? About a year. So you obviously know Anthony well. The plump boy pushed his glasses briskly up his nose. What is this? Another interview? It had better be a quickie. I'm on my way to the bathroom here. Sorry, yes. I was just wondering about the house and how he came to have it. I mean, it's got all this stuff in it, and yet Lockwood's here on his own. I mean, I don't see how... What you mean, George interrupted, is... Where are the parents? Correct? I nodded. Yes. He doesn't like to talk about them. As you'll find out, if you last long enough to ask him, I think they were psychic researchers of some kind. You can tell that from all the objects on the walls. They were rich, too. You can tell that from the house. Anyway, they're long gone. I believe Lockwood was in care for years with a relative of some kind. Then he trained as an agent with gravediggers, sykes, and got the house back somehow. He adjusted his newspaper and marched across the landing. No doubt you can use your psychic sensitivity to find out more. But I was frowning after him. In care? So does that mean his parents? One way or another, I should think it means they're dead. And with that, he closed the bathroom door. Well, 
It isn't hard to guess which colleague I favored as I lie awake that night under the attic eaves. On the one hand, Anthony Lockwood, vigorous and energetic, eager to throw himself into each new mystery, a boy who was clearly never happier than when walking into a haunted room, his hand resting lightly on his sword hilt. On the other, George Cubbins, handsome as a freshly opened tub of margarine, as charismatic as a wet tea towel lying scrumpled on the floor. I guessed he was never happier than when surrounded by dusty files and piled plates of food, and since he was prickly and seemed to find me irksome, I resolved to keep far away from him as I could. But it already pleased me to think of walking into darkness with Lockwood at my side. End of chapter 7